in Enlightenment Kant, human idealism, and post-colonial theory. This was published on a range of figures um, that have been central to the development of German idealism, including Kant, Reinhold, Fichte, as well as on issues related to colonialism. I'll mention two of her recent publications. Um, in Fichte's studio in 2020, the subsequent delivery of the reduction of Fichte's transformation of Kant's deduction of the categories. And a second, Reinhardt's unanswered prize question, history and colonialism in late 18th century Germany, which is forthcoming in a collected volume called Controversy, Controversies and Price Tag in, in the German Enlightenment with Bloomsbury. And the title of her talk today is Rebuilding Paradise, uh, Johann Baptist Pieter and Leopold Zeher on colonialism and history. Yeah, thank you very much for, for, for the kind introduction. I'm really very happy to be back in Berlin again, and um, I'm more than happy to be at this conference. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for being together. Um, so my motivation for this talk is the claim of post and decolonial theory to offer a decolonial understanding of history that somehow opposes the conceptions developed in modern Europe and especially, of course, in German idealism. And the debate so far has mainly uh, been related to a critique of Eurocentric view on history on the one hand, so we can think of, of Brussel, for example, and the critique of um, the conception of history aiming at progress at the other. And one of the most influential thinkers in this debate is the Mexican thinker Leo Bolesea, born in uh, 1912, um, who has also been a, a very um, uh, uh, important figure in the philosophy of the um, uh, liberation, whose attempt to elaborate a Latin American philosophy of history has influenced generations of thinkers after. And what makes Zia an interesting thinker for our conference today, I think, is that he's not concerned with an absolute deconstruction of European modern philosophy of history. Um, rather, he tries to adapt uh, the European philosophy of idealism to Latin American circumstances. Thus, he is not only concerned with overcoming the idealistic philosophy of history, but with somehow continuing it uh, under the colonial classes. And in the following, I will attempt to present the project of an adaption of some of the aspects of an idealistic philosophy of history by bringing it into a dialogue with uh, the latter. So, like a little like like Louis said yesterday, I'm very interested in the question: what what is this aspect in German idealism that can be adapted by post-colonial theory? And on the other hand, how can we adapt? How, what what need what needs to be changed, and what what can we take from that? Um, and as a representative of the idealistic philosophy of history, I will, a little counterintuitively, not examine Hegel today, who I think we will see in a minute has really a, a, an important uh, methodological role for Zea, um, but you are not in speech. The dialogue between Zea and Fichte is uh, purely fictitious, as far as I know. <laughs> um, uh, Zea never um, published at least something on, on Fichte. But um, his, his um, teacher, uh, Jose Gauss, who is probably the most important uh, intellectual figure in the, in the life of Veda, um, has, is the translator of, uh, of the works of Fichte uh, in Spanish. So the Zwei Einleitungen mit die Wissenschaftslehre and the um, Fichte's uh, philosophy of history is translated by uh, Gauss. So, of course, they are known as um, philosophers. But uh, as I said, so the dialect is uh, purely fictitious. So we have we don't have text uh, from there of our fiction. Nevertheless, people's philosophy of history seems to me in some sense the most appropriate point of reference for pointing out the colonial adaptation of German idealism. And this uh, connects very nicely, I think, with the talk of Kinena. For the core of people, as well as their philosophy of history, involves this, according to my interpretation, around a tension between the claim to be universally valid and at the same time of wanting to give room for the particular as the particular. I think this is really very original in both in Fichte and Fichte. Um, both Fichte and Zea use the metaphor of paradise to illustrate their struggling with the mediation between universality and particularity in their respective concepts of history. So in order to, to avoid the impossible task of having to present the entire philosophy of history of both thinkers today, I will limit myself today 
uh, to comparison of their respective concepts of paradise. To this end, um, I will outline um, first um, the function of the paradise metaphor in previous philosophy of history, and then uh, shed light on the function of the paradise metaphor in data. Um, just saying that the PowerPoint is nothing special, it's just a, it's just the growth, nothing. So first, um, the paradise, um, or the function of the paradise is um, <clears throat> It must first be noted that Fichte nowhere developed a systematic scientific philosophy of this. So uh, three of his uh, popular writings are generally regarded as his philosophy of history. It's uh, the Grundzüge der Gegenwärtigen und Gegenwärtigen Zeitalters, published in 1806, um, this a series of popular um, philosophical lectures given by Fichte between 1804 and 1805. And it's, um, of course, this popular philosophical um, and controversial reading and Deutsche Zion, which we uh, just heard about, and then the so called Staatslehre published in 1830. However, Fichte does not provide any writing on the philosophy of history that goes beyond the ambition of an introductory survey page. The study of Fichte's philosophy of history thus always includes a certain construction of it, which usually has to draw on various works and elements from Fichte's philosophy, which cannot necessarily be unproblematically combined with each other. The contributions of their generally still quite spare secondary literature on the subject are correspondingly divergent. And the thesis I would like to present to you today is that Fichte's philosophy of history attempts to take into account both an absolute necessity, namely an a priori structure of history, and a contingency, namely an only empirically observable cause of historical events. And from this tension between universality and particular emerges, as we, wish, as we shall see, an emphasis on the future, which will be uh, central to our engagement with uh, Zia's concept of history in the second part of the lecture. Fichte outlines what is perhaps his clearest concept of history in the Grundzüge. And there he argues um, that the st structure of history can be understood a priori because history is the development of knowledge of the science. For this talk, we fortunately do not need to understand the connection between history and knowledge in depth. Yeah. What is important for us is that Fichte takes it to be possible to have an insight into the structures of history. This insight he calls a unified concept of the entire human life on Earth, which he modestly defines as the so called world plan, Weltplan. The world plan is thus the figure that gives us insight into a kind of scheme of a course or an end point of history. Fichte describes this end of goal of history as follows. Um, the purpose of, of, of the end of the life of mankind on earth is this, that in this life on earth, uh, it, in it may, be, may establish all its relations with freedom according to this. Now, the purpose of history is to become reasonable through human freedom, or better, to make itself reasonable, as Fichte said. Oriented according to this purpose, the history of man takes its, its presumed starting point from the instinctive realization of an order among men, that's the Kanun's instinct, reason instinct, and the eventual goal of the history of the human species is the emergence of freedom in the rational organization of human affairs, in which the formal leading role of rational instinct is then replaced by rational consideration and free decision. Um, <clears throat> So um, by this remark, the earthly life of the human race is divided into two main epochs and ages. The one in which the species lives and is without having yet established its condition with freedom according to reason, and the other in which it brings about this rational arrangement with me. So two epochs in, um, in, the, in the whole uh, in the history. And Fichte now interposes several intermediate links between the two epochs of or epoch, so that he arrives at five main epochs, each of which represents the state of the development of knowledge. But we are not interested in these five epochs here, but um, for us it's only important that Fichte uses now the met metaphor of paradise to sketch the entire course of history, so from this first main epoch to the last main epoch. This is a bit larger for a quote, but I, I, mean, I only read the, um, uh, the passages I um, put in, in both. Thus, the whole progress which, upon this view, humanity makes itself, 
is only a reproduction to the point on which it stood at first, and has nothing in view save that it returned to its original conditions. Only mankind is to go or should go, yeah, ought to go this way on its own feet, by its own strength. It must bring itself back to that stage in which it was once before without any help from it, and which, for that very purpose, it must first of all. In paradise, to use a random picture, in the paradise of innocence and well-being, without knowledge, effort, and art, humanity awakens to life. Scarcely had it has it gathered courage to venture upon independent existence when the angel comes with the fiery sword of compulsion to good and drives it forth from the seat of its innocence in its peace. Having grown bolder through hardship, it builds its own paradise after the image of the lost one. The tree of life, life arises and stretches forth its head to the fruit and eats and gives to the immortality. So, what is striking about this story is that Fichte does not present the return to paradise as, um, yeah, as, as, a, as a necessary course of history, as one might expect uh, from history that follows a world plan. Instead, he works with normative capacity. Mankind is supposed to return, it ought to return. And this or, according to my reputation, results from the tension between a priori world plan on the one hand and empirical contingency on the other. Now, we thought the elaborate thesis, the role of empirical contingency in Fichte's philosophy of history can best be understood through the task Fichte ascribes to the philosophy of history. In all three of his writings on uh, history, Fichte states that the task of the philosophy of history is to characterize the present age place it in the overall context of history, that is the whole plan, and on this basis to point out the coming of a new age and about all the means to bring it about. Philosophy, and the philosophy of history in particular, thus has an active role in the bringing forth of history. It acts on history by making what has occurred understandable and then intervening in the actual world so as to prepare it for the future. Now it's striking that the, that the purely a priori perspective of philosophy cannot achieve. By no means can everything be deduced from the world plan. Thus, the development um, of the human species occurs only gradually, disturbed by forces foreign to it at certain times, in certain places, under certain special circumstances. All these special uh, environments do not all emerge for the, <coughs> the world plan. And here enters uh, the pure uh, empiricism of history is a priori element. So thanks to our insight into the world plan, it is possible for Conway uh, an overview of the whole of history, but it is not possible to determine whether, when, and how the individual steps of the world plan manifest themselves in the concrete. The actual course of history is therefore not predetermined, not even its successful conclusion. Both are exposed to the imponderables the contingency of the gift. Only man, as an historical actor, as a contingent empirical individual, and as a necessary moral being at the same time, can bring about a synthesis between necessity and contingency. The reality of the world plan depends on its implementation by the human actor, who can either act in the sense of the world plan or not. History thus becomes a moral task, namely to overcome the gap between the necessary, a historical sphere, and the contingent individual action, and thus to realize reason in the sphere. One's own action inscribes itself in history when it is motivated by an insight into the purpose of history. Uh, <clears throat> so, and this, this um, beautiful conception of history now is inscribed into a framework of a profoundly Eurocentric worldview. For bringing forth a new epoch is um, Europe's task. For Fichte, as for many of his contemporaries, the new world presents immaturity, the first unconscious paradise, the first prehistorical age of the instinct of reason. Um, I quote it from a really obscure text of Fichte. Um, so therefore, it's, it's, a bit, uh, it's, it's not a very nice sentence, but I hope you can understand the, uh, the main contents. So there are two times, it says, the one that was in the immediate being of the good without knowledge, the form of the old world, opposite this principle of the primal world, is the principle of the second world, knowledge seen through. 
the old time, for example, in the North American forest has not yet come to an end. So we have, we, we see that it identifies the, the first uh, epoch of so the conscious paradise um, with the North American forest. From the uh, identification of the new world with the first age now follows inevitably the moral task that comes to us humans from the world plan. It cannot be intended that those um, savage tribes should always remain savage. So jene wilden Stämme können nicht immer wild bleiben sollen. No race can be born with all the capacities of perfect humanity and yet be designed never to develop these capacities, never to become more than which an animal by its own proper nature might be. Those savages must be designed to be the progenitors of more powerful, cultivated, and virtuous generations. So the paradise of the savages is thus to be turned into the created paradise of man who has become free um, through knowledge. So let me now summarize the um, Fichte uh, part of history. So first, the goal of history is that man becomes rational, not by instinct, but uh, of his own effort, free. The metaphor for this thought is the following. Paradise, so reason as instinct, must be built once again. Second, this goal is a moral task, and that not, that, that's not something that would somehow develop in the material events of history. And man, as a morally active being, is the sole agent of history. And we, man, um, needs as much as the particular European man. Only this European man gives meaning to history, or rather to the previous lack of history in the corner. Um. Let me now um, switch to uh, to Zea. So some uh, 200 years after the publication of Fichte's Grundzüge, uh, Leopold Zea develops the decolonial philosophy of history that also works with the metaphor of paradise. This can be most clearly identified in three writings: um, America como and uh, America como conciencia, America en la historia, and a rather unknown essay entitled El Paraíso de Colonna Homeboy, to which I will mainly refer in the following. Their starting point is the thesis that America emerges as an European idea. The paradigm crisis that Europe experienced in the um, 16th century onwards, so technical and social innovations, uh, redefinition of the human being and the court, generated the need for a place uh, of refuge. As a paradise, America is supposed to be the answer to the problems of modern times. America was supposed uh, to be the better future of Europe. And um, what exactly does this mean? In his essay from 1999, um, Zia ties these longings of Europe to two conceptions of paradise, for which he finds Christopher Columbus and Alexander von Humboldt as representatives. According to Zia, um, when Columbus first arrived in the New World, uh, 1492, he declared what he found to be paradise. <clears throat> of paradise, says Columbus, the old and new scriptures have spoken. They have placed an existing or magic place in the Holy Land. Yet it is here, on the continent found by Columbus, that the real paradise is to be found. On his first voyage, Columbus was enraptured by these beautiful and naked people and wondered are they angels of paradise or beasts? No, here is paradise with its jungle skies and innocent creatures. What else can the great lord of the sea expect? Two points are important in this quotation. Firstly, um, the Columbine paradise is characterized here as a paradise of material goods. The Zia attributes to this type of paradise above all the beauty and nakedness of its inhabitants and the wealth above all gold, silver, and spices. Secondly, the last line indicates that Columbus expects paradise. To be more ex uh, precise, Zia explains he expects the paradise promised to him by European literature, mainly uh, Marco Polo and Stephen Jung. The concept of an earthly paradise, according to Zia, is thus already preformed. What drives Columbus, according to Zia, are lust and greed for the redemption of the European cross. Zia now sketches a second figure of paradise described to Alexander von Humboldt, who sets out the, for the New World three centuries later. Zia argues that Humboldt's journey is also motivated by European literature. However, he is not inspired by Marco Polo, but by uh, Rousseau's Emile and Goethe's Werk, uh, just as speaking. The characteristics of the paradise he seeks are correspondingly divergent. Silk and gold hardly play a role. What motivates Humboldt, according to Zia, is 
loneliness, tired of new things and mutation. It is the nostalgia for a simpler romantic world, like Rousseau's good savage. He's the man to whom revolutionaries in France wanted to return to put an end to history that justified the journey. For whom was that? The paradise defined by romantic reading consists in a place of innocence, a kind of childhood, childhood humanity understood in terms of natural law. Here, untamed by the misdeeds of misguided reason, Humboldt sees the potential for a better world, for a, in Zia's words, future that arises in the present and prepares the future. The return to paradise is thus at the turning away from the sins of Europe, the new beginning, untamed. So what we see from these two um, kinds of paradise Zia sketches is that youth's longing um, are changing. So we have on the one side this longing for material goods and on the other uh, the longing for, for um, uh, innocence. But what remains the same is the claim that America as this paradise is created to fulfill uh, Europe's longing. And this fact now um, creates a contradiction for the American, which for Zia constitutes the core of um, American culture. In order to become the paradise of Europe, America must first be made, made fertile, that is, colonized. And this brings us to the contact of Europeans with the inhabitants of the paradise. Mm -hmm. Both Columbus and Humboldt, according to Zia, underline the innocence of these inhabitants. And um, however, in the European discourse, this innocence quickly turns into immaturity, for example, by a uh, reform the power. Mm -hmm. um, so the unredeemed, so it's Zia again. The unredeemed shows itself in their skin, their brain, their habits, the customs. If they had a soul or reason, they could not use it. The body with which nature has endowed them for them. All men are equal in reason or their dialect. Uh, sorry. All men are equal in rights to reason or intellect, says Descartes, the father of modernity, but different by their qualities, by their history, culture, ways, etc. The very success of Western civilization shows the world the, superior, the, the superiority of its people. So with that, for the American, this means he, he and she lives in paradise, but he himself is unworthy of paradise. Um, the history of the American man consists of his will to live in the future, of his refusal to recognize that he has his own circumstances of his effort to be a youth in utopia, of his refusal to be in America. Uh, as paradise then, um, America is full of possibilities. As reality, however, it is full of engagement. The paradise, as the youth would think of it, thus leads into a paradox. It fails. And it fails because it claims the universality, the European dream of the end of history to be realized in America, that is incompatible compatible with the concrete American conditions. They are now contrast this um, concept of a European paradise with another concept of paradise, that is uh, of Simon Bolivar. According to Zea, Bolivar's concept of uh, uh, paradise adapts aspects of the 18th century European philosophy. This philosophy denies that in America um, originality or authenticity, but at the same time, it provides the tools to develop its own ideas in America. Central to this is the idea of independence. The paradise of Bolivar, born in Caracas in, in 1783, is characterized by unity of free Latin American nations that can prevent foreign domination. It is a paradise of liberation from oppression. Um, so this is um, the next quote. I read it, I, I not fully read it. Out of violence and colonization came freedom. The uh, liberators of this multiracial and multicultural world made this utopia the future of the world. Their ecumenical vision was born out of suffering. Now they are striving to realize their own utopia. It's no longer the utopia of Europe, but the utopia of America, which includes Europe and the rest of the world. Again, it is important to draw attention to two points. First, Bolivar's vision is one that only emerges from violence. Paradise only emerges from suffering, and it does not emerge from passively enduring suffering, but from rebelling against it. It is in resistance that a vision of freedom is born. Bolivar's paradise is a creative paradise, as, uh, that is, a paradise that has been painstakingly rescued. 
Accordingly, the inhabitants of this paradise are no longer, I quote, inhabited by naked atoms, but by people who are willing to put them at his service and share them generously with the world. It is in this sense that Zia had tried to collect the ideas and particular history of different peoples throughout Latin America and read them under the one common experience of dependency of colonial violence. Secondly, Zea uses the term utopia for this vision of paradise that emerges from Saka. Zea is concerned here with the effective power of utopian thinking, which he wants to reclaim for human action in history. As Zea points out in many of his writings, and this and activating utopian thinking must start from the historical experience of those peoples who are able to, or who are to be liberated uh, by this uh, utopia. Utopia is thus supposed to be a non place mediated by the consciousness of a particular concrete place from which to, uh, to make this. Instead of adapting the American circumstances to the European worldview, which, as we've seen, uh, ends in the paradox, uh, Zia proposes to adapt the European worldview to the American circumstances. Uh, <clears throat> so, let us now uh, summarize the results of our discussion of the Zia in three points. First, America, according to Zia's thesis, comes into being to fulfill the longings of Europe. These are outlined on the one hand with Columbus' paradise, on the other with Humboldt's paradise. Second, such a conception of paradise plunges America into a paradox. It must cease to exist in order to become the future. And three, Bolivar's paradise of a united America shaking off oppression offers a counter template to the European concept of paradise. This emerges from a resistance to oppression and the creation of its own identity. And I'm now coming to the conclusion. We have seen that both thinkers, Fichte and Zea, understand history as the recreation of a paradise. Zea's decolonial overcoming of the idealist European conception consists in the fact that he does not want to rebuild the old paradise, but by exposing its fatal consequences, he creates a new paradise. In this way, he offers a way to make the philosophy of the history of German idealism fruitful, perhaps even readable from uh, today's perspective. Both conceptions of history are based on a tension between the aspiration to presenting universal laws of history and leaving room for the particular or To this end, Fichte introduces the perspective of the moral actor. Zea now has shown first that this actor fails because of a Eurocentric uh, universal she is committed to, and second, Zea tries to offer an alternative to this uh, universal. According to Zea, it must be thought from the concrete circumstances. Now, of course, we also have much critique on this position of Zea, and I would like to mention uh, at least one. Then we want to ask whether such an idealistic, aspect, log logical philosophy of history is still contemporary at all. And the Colombian philosopher Santiago Castro Gomez, for uh, example, criticized Zea in precisely this sense in 1996. In a critique based on Foucault, um, Castle Gomez analyzes that Zea represents a philosophy according to the modern ideal, according to which man is the center of reality and the absolute owner of his own uh, history. And it's linked uh, to a concept of uh, the subject, according to which it is uh, conceived humanistically as self consciousness that is as the seat of, uh, uh, all of uh, as the seat and origin of language and sense. And under uh, and, uh, these auspices, the, the question then naturally arises as to whether it makes any sense at all to make the philosophy of history in German idealism fruitful from the colonial perspective. But these questions lead maybe into another discussion that Adorno, for example, addresses in his lecture on history. Can the philosophy of history ever treat anything other than a sense of history? And this, of course, nothing we can solve today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, would you like to unshare your screen? Sorry, yeah. I'm going to see the people online. Um, thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, so we have at least 15 minutes for questions and discussion. So first, online, going to Zola. Thank you so much for this presentation, and especially 
the focus on the Fichte text. This uh, set of uh, lectures by Fichte, as you said, is popular. And uh, it has a very strong religious overlay. There is talk about sinfulness, especially with regard to the present age. It's a work that in part looks back to the past, in part looks back to the future, but mainly also by its title, focuses on the present as the age of, as it's called, completed sinfulness. Very extreme and in that sense already, as you said, eschatological characterization. The interesting thing is that as part of a progressivist history, there is no idea of a return to a pristine past. It's a progress in five stages. And the final stage is in no way a repeat at a redeemed level of anything that has been previously lost, as in all the historical narratives about a paradise, paradise lost, paradise regained. So could you relate that future to the paradise discourse in uh, uh, Zoe author and the further reference then? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, you know, like maybe I I um I didn't emphasize this enough that also in Fichte, of course, we have the same movement. So the, the, the paradise we are going to is a new paradise. It's really the paradise we build up. And I um um I meant to show that this is very similar to the the concept they are, of course. We also have the, we have the uh, uh, primary paradise and then through hardship we go to another paradise and this is really distinct from from the first one mm -hmm. um but i think um and and this is of course the, I, I think this is the debate so either we could we could think okay um there is the difference between zea and Fichte in this regard would be that uh zea sees that the at least the implementation of this notion of a paradise of Fichte, including that the uh, new world is somehow uh, stuck in the first epoch, um, is some uh, paid somehow to, for for what reason ever. And then we need to to uh, criticize first this uh, notion of, of of a paradise, or at least um, um, annihilate uh, the um, colonial aspects of it. And then we have like. A, a similar model, but then like a, a purified model. And the second, the second uh, strand would be, as as Pastor Gomez uh, takes it, yeah. I mean, he criticized they are actually for this. So he's there is actually doing precisely what what Fischer did, but from the perspective of Latin America. So we have a very similar model, um, which is also, of course, yeah, as such, uh, as such a I'm yes. sorry. <laughs> it's, it's even it's even difficult in German. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question from Thank you. Um, thank you, Lisa. It was wonderful, and I was really excited to hear Bolivia and Bolivia here. So. Um, uh, who um, many have argued is a Fichtean spirit. <laughs> um, but going back to, to your talk, um, I find it really interesting what, what you did, uh, in putting in parallel the, the two ideas of, of paradise and uh, how to think the uh, history of philosophy as, um, well, as a rebuilding of some lost stage. I think that has a lot to do with um, how idealism thinks about you know, the origin and, and the final end as something being actually the same, but one always functioning as a step, starting point, but also as an idea towards humanity progressing. And I also think that you uh, you, you did a, a wonderful reading of a really hard text. The group to get past some passages that are difficult to, to read from a decolonial perspective. But well, you, you emphasize the, the other ones, the ones that state that primitives have, must have the possibility to become uh, formed and educated and free. Um, so but but I think I, I picked up on, on this 
idea that well if this project is eurocentric in the idea that uh, it's the culture developed in Europe that must be taken to the Americas or to other savage regions uh, in order to provide the tools for these savages to build them. Um, however, I, and this is a question because we've, um, we've had a lot of discussions on, on these texts and on, on those passages and how to interpret. And of course, um, the first take is very Eurocentric and one reacts negatively against that. <laughs> but um, when you um, kind of balance what Fichte is saying in those two moments with Fichte's really radical criticism of his own age and of European enlightenment that he develops in this book. Don't you think that maybe it, it could change or, or it, it could at least raise the question, is he really advocating for a universalization of a culture that he's so harshly criticizing? That's my question. Yeah, yeah, this is a really good question. And I, I don't have a definite answer to this. But I, I also tend to think that, yes, we can. We can just somehow read Fichte as you did, of course, really in favor of this, um, uh, yeah, a, a really a truly universalist, right? that, that really includes uh, all and has an eye for the particular. And I, I think this, this at least is something I, yeah, I, I'm very interested in Fichte's philosophy of history, that I think there's really an, an openness, a tension, a, a good tension between the universal and the particular. And I think um, Fichte needs room for this. He really needs room for the country. And um, <coughs> it's new. I, I fully agree with, with you. I think um, we, can, we can at least um, yeah, engage in a, in a reading of Fichte where, where we don't have to, to push this Eurocentristic passages too far, though, so that we, yeah, we can make something uh, decolonial out of it. Yeah. I, I think the key element would be to concentrate on, on this um, very explicit criticism of its own name. Yeah. So in yeah. European Enlightenment, for Fichte is not the way to go. Yeah. And that is very clear in, 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 in yeah. So he's giving us the two versions is saying, well, um, such a mass advantage, there is a history of the humanity and everyone is included, but um, yeah, and well, somehow Europe is at the at the, the highest age, but still, of course, in the in the in the of course, most the simple, uh, the, the yeah, simple yeah. End, but then we have to go to the well, there are two more, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. more. yeah. And we have a yeah. and, it, 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 and he at least he doesn't say that that this is impossible to to make this turn from from the new world. Okay. So it, it is yeah. Maybe it, 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 there are a lot of tensions, yeah. but also there is a lot of room yeah. for interpretation and, and for reading. Yeah. But they go in another direction. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, but just the question. But, um, but I think it, it's very. I mean, their critique, of course, is very important. That Especially then, and this identification of the new world with the paradise, which is also, of course, in Reinhardt and the Rowan and everywhere, it's just everywhere in the 18th century, is, yeah, it, it, of course, it lies at the core of this uh, American paradise. Yeah. yeah. And no, no, I, I understand. And says, says criticism is not valid, but yeah. it's also, yeah, it has to be spread in a yeah. context and yeah. with a yeah. precise purpose. Yeah. And systematically, you can maybe just uh, make something. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. The next question is from Christopher. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, Gisa. I, I I suppose I'm curious about the the extent to which Saya is or isn't uh, apprehensive about utopianism. So I, I don't know exactly what what uh, how 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 to formulate this, but because of how deeply embedded utopianism seems to be in in the European tradition, it seems to me like uh, it would be wise of Sea to be skeptical about its power in some sense, so it's the power of utopian thinking and and there are criticisms, of course, after Sea about utopianism that I think are 
pretty well known. But uh, that leads me to think that, <laughs> you know, just m making this sort of appeal that you were, or, 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 or this alluding that Seados to something like Bolivar's, uh, uh, I suppose, different version of utopianism. I'm, I'm not sure that would be able or would be enough to cut it, as it were, to be able to disembed, to dislodge uh, futurity from European, European futurity, as it were, right? Uh, and, or maybe this is the role of concrete circumstances that you were describing that does that, that is gonna, I, I just don't know, it really is a question out of curiosity. Thanks for the talk again. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. So the role of Vitruvius, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Also because I think in there himself is that you have different phases. So I think from from 99 onwards, he, he really gets very universal. Universal. So it's 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 much more difficult to um to combine this view with with um with a Vitruvia eye sketch now. Like I I um yeah. Maybe I, I pushed a bit too hard on this uh, term utopia. But I think what he means is that, um, of course, he's very, very critical of, of the um, European concept of utopia. And he's very aware, I think, of the danger that comes from profit. But I think he, um, as, as I understand, he really wants somehow to, um, to open up the path for, uh, for um, a, a different uh, relation between um, Something like um, like something universal in the future and and our really particular concrete um, circumstances that somehow we have to um, uh, reconcile. And I think this this he tries at least with his um, with his philosophy of history here, where where he um, tries to to collect all these uh, concrete particular histories of through Latin America and um, um, somehow seeks for them through the concept of dependency or violence, um, something, a vision, let's say, for the future that, is re, uh, that can be uh, realized. And I think this is, or well, this was my point, I think that, that, um, that Utopia would uh, somehow be a better term than paradise, because it's, it's, not, it's not something you dream of, or that's not, nothing in, in Utopos, like in somewhere, somewhere, but it's really, um, it is something, it, it's not yet there, but, we have already the means to somehow realize it, and this must go through the that must start from the very concrete um path of, of Latin America. So, but I think these are there, there are many elements somehow, and um, I think also in Zea's thinking itself, it's very hard to combine them. So, I'm, I'm also thinking, I'm still, um, yeah, in the middle of uh, somehow figuring out how this, how this works. Then. Great. Um, and I think our last, oh, okay, we'll, we'll squeeze in two more <laughs> questions. Um, next, Louise. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Giza. It was, it was very interesting. And, uh, and I think it, it brings a new perspective to both sides. And I think this is the purpose of the conference. So this, this was really nice. And I have a question about, about Zaya's notion of history, uh, and especially about his conception of the past, because you, you yeah. talked a lot about uh, his conception of the future. Yeah. And I was wondering how he sees the past and the relationship between the past and the future. Because when you go to fish the stacks and, and you presented it very well, you said, look, there is this first innocent paradise, then there is hardship, and then there is the, the, yeah. the paradise we, we fight for. Uh, and hardship is, is somehow necessary because you have to fight to get to the, ne to the next stage. And if Zaya, he, he has a similar uh, structure, he would have to say, look, oppression is necessary because you have to fight oppression to get to the next stage. But, but I don't know how he sees this, how he sees this intermediary step, how he sees the past. So how, how, do, you, how do you see the whole picture together when we, yeah. 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 yeah, I think, yeah, I think the past is really particularly important for, for, for Zaya because, yeah. um, um, as a, as a briefly uh, sketch, like we have the, the problem we yeah. have is that America is humiliated um, yeah. from by you. So uh, America has created the moment we discovered it. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. a, it, it doesn't have any past. It's yeah. just the future, nothing else. It's yeah. the paradise. It's yeah. just the land without a past. Yeah. And I think for there, it's, it's, 
of utmost importance, importance that we um we really study the parts of that of that in America because that then only we become a historical uh, agent. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to become a historical agent. And I think I think through this, through really counting a historical agent, through mm -hmm. rewriting, uh, rewriting that writing mm -hmm. Latin American history from the Latin American point of view, not from the European uh, sure. paradise view, um we then we become agents and then we have the possibility to somehow act in the future. Right? Okay. Yeah. But thanks, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, nice. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, yeah. 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 Okay. I'd like to uh, pick up on um, something that Yelena earlier said. Uh, so I haven't read this, I just think if I appreciate the rooms to them, but Yelena uh, suggested that it's a quite a problematic text. And so I have a kind of methodological question. So, um, are you doing a kind of cherry picking um, and presenting us with the nice bits uh, that um, that we can all you know uh, relate to and uh, leaving out the more problematic parts? And so I I, I guess that this can be done uh, for particular purposes. But um, uh, if you work on the texts in your capacity as a thesis scholar, would it be more uh, appropriate to um, affirm the complexity of the text and to uh, also uh, um, um, highlight the problematic features of the text and then go on to um, to ask the question of what can we uh, take away from it nevertheless yeah because I, I I thought I was doing this. I, I found this already crash <laughs> okay so because I think this this is this is a, a really very Eurocentric view, say like these uh, peoples have to they, they are still in the uh, pre-historical epoch they need to be educated and I think this is already cherry picking in the other in the other direction precisely so yeah I think these are like the one the 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 worst passages in it when 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 he really says like yeah it's a really deeply uh, Eurocentric view of it. and I tried somehow to reconcile it with his more meta philosophical um thoughts on on uh, what is the philosophy of this okay. and yeah but I, I take them to be already quite quite okay okay yeah yeah so i somehow yeah. had the impression that the stress was more on uh, well what what can we nevertheless learn from this in this regard um yeah okay but uh yeah yeah i think i, I think it's a bit both like in my i mean yeah, that we have uh, uh, definitely the concept he provides is, is that it's it's so profound in Eurocentric, Eurocentric, uh, yeah, yeah, like almost all of the text. But I think there is some, I think it's, it's my hope from this really systematic point of view, from this this tension between universal and can I think this is something I think we can use as an instrument. This is the only thing we can say if if at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. And um, so let's uh, thank Geza.